okay, I think I have to give the timer the official, like, let's go. Um, so welcome to a uh, fraternity of people, right? We're all in this common shared belief that brands being more human matters, that it makes a difference. And I know that the people watching on the live stream are part of that fraternity also. But I wanted to talk to you about a problem that I think we all face and what might be a solution for it. And I think the problem is that our fraternity is relatively small still. Uh, people who believe that this idea of brands being more human is a great idea in theory, right? If I asked you all to raise your hands if you thought that was important, you'd say yes. Uh, if I said, uh, do you care about the companies that you buy from being more human? Most of you would probably say yes too. But if it matters so much, then why are so many companies so dramatically bad at it? Why are so many companies inhuman, right? How many, why are so many companies unable to become more human? So I started thinking about that, and it actually led me to an interesting place. I was in uh, Scandinavia a couple months ago, and I heard about this story of a king, the king uh, of Sweden in the 1600s, early 1600s, uh, King Gustavus Adolphus. And he was king of Sweden at a time when they were going through their golden age. They were expanding, they had an empire. Uh, it was a really important time for Sweden. And as a symbol of that, uh, of that time, in 1626, he commissioned a ship to be built. And the ship was meant to be a symbol of what Sweden was in the world at that time. So he got the best shipbuilders that he could find, and he got the amazing designers, and they created this ship called the Vasa. And the Vasa took two years to build and had all sorts of ornamentation and really things that had never been seen on a ship before. The only problem was that in 1627, a year after he commissioned this ship, the Dutch built a bigger ship. So now you've got this ship that you've already started building, and you've got someone else who just released a bigger ship, and it's like someone building a bigger tower when you were about to build the biggest tower in the world. Now what do you do? So, of course, they added things to their ship. Uh, in the software world, we might call that scope creep, right? They just added things. So he added more cannons above the deck, he added more ornamentation, um, all sorts of things. And people did it because they wanted to please the king. The king is the king. 1628 comes around, they have a huge uh, celebration. And they're about to launch this ship. They launch a ship, it goes one kilometer out of the dock, and it sinks. So now, you're looking at this and you're saying, well, you know, surely somebody must have known this, right? Um, the ship was imbalanced, uh, it was top heavy. Uh, when they did model simulations of the ship and blew wind, fake wind, at it, it tipped over. So, on some level, people knew, but they launched it anyway. Why does that happen? Why do we do these things that we know to be wrong because, you know, we just do them? So that got me thinking about this idea of a central problem that I think explains why brands are unhuman and also why the ship sank back in Sweden 400 years ago. And it really comes down to this idea that it's no one's job to fix it. And people are just doing what they're told because they're trying to be obedient and they're trying to do the right thing. So now if you think about how this relates to marketing, you've got ads that pretend like they're not ads, right? Here's a great one about the Sony PlayStation that says this is not an ad, and underneath in small text it says it's a reminder to purchase a PlayStation for someone you love at Christmas. So it's not an ad, but it is an ad. Then you've got Cocoa Krispies talking about how they're gonna boost your child's immunity. I don't even know how this is possible, um, but apparently the immunity is so low that even Cocoa Krispies um, can solve that problem for our children. And really what it's pointing to is this idea that people have a very low opinion of marketing and what marketing is trying to do to all of us. Here are just a couple of covers of books that have recently come out around this idea of marketing as a form of mind control, as a form of spin, um, as, a, uh, as a thing that's eating our culture, right? These are all real things that are out there because this is how marketing is seen. So marketing has a pretty big PR problem, if you think about it. And it's well-deserved in a lot of cases. And the problem, partially, is that we're trying to focus on changing perception without really changing reality. And so when you focus just on perception, you end up trying to fix something without actually fixing something. 
And that is a really big problem because now what you're trying to do is you're just trying to make people feel good, right? You're trying to make yourself look better. And you're trying to make people feel good, but you're not actually doing anything. And I think that there's this sense that marketing is the icing on top of a really crap tasting cake. And that doesn't work anymore. And there's a couple reasons why that doesn't work anymore. The first is that we're not actually adding anything of value, right? So here's a couple signs. I mean, if you look at these, you're like, why would anyone do these, right? They're, they're extraneous. They're not useful for anyone. They don't say anything. And in a lot of ways, our marketing is doing the same thing. The other problem is that we believe that people are fundamentally uh, stupider than ourselves. Um, and that's unfortunately not true. Um, and so people's BS detection is much, much higher. So, you know, you might try and sell donut seeds, but people kind of know that they're Cheerios. I don't know how the cereal thing started becoming a theme in this. It just did. So, um, And then we kind of don't think that, that there's anything wrong with that, right? We, we sort of feel like that's the normal thing, and people are doing it, and so everyone does it. And I think that what it comes down to is a big question that we need to answer. And the big question is that if marketing has caused what I call the modern believability crisis, then how do we get out of it? How do we convince anyone of anything when we've created this charade of materials that are completely unbelievable because of their ridiculous nature or because of their uselessness? How do we shift that back? How do we change it? So that's the question that I'd like to try and answer today. And the place where I'll start is with an interesting phenomenon that anyone who's taking flying lessons would already know about, which is something called the wingtip vortex. And it sounds like a really serious problem. Um, but essentially what the wingtip vortex is, is when you fly an aircraft, uh, there are twin tunnels created behind each one of the wings. And this vortex causes a big problem for any planes that are flying behind a larger plane, because they can get caught in the vortex and they can lose their balance, and then um, the plane can, can kind of, uh, you know, have all sorts of bad things happen. Instrumentation can fail, they can, um, they can have an accident, all sorts of things. So this wingtip vortex is part of the reason why there's a mandated minimum distance between airplanes when they take off, because of this vortex. It's also why you'll never have a really, really small plane take off directly behind a really, really big plane. You have to stagger the sizes of the planes. Right, so what does any of this have to do with marketing? Well, in the 1960s, an engineer in NASA came up with a solution for the wingtip vortex. What he found was that if you just take the ends of the wings and turn them upwards in a vertical way, like this wing, you cut about 80% of this vortex from even happening. So here's a super simple solution for a problem that's plagued aviation ever since people began flying. But it took 25 to 30 years for that to ever be implemented. And the reason was that no one wanted to go and spend the money to retrofit these planes with these wingtips that turned upwards. And now if you see those on airplanes, that's the reason why they're there. So a super simple fix, but it took forever to actually make it happen. Now you think about Oprah and why Oprah was a phenomenon. And I know someone's um, talking later on today who's a contributor to, to Oprah. Um, to Oprah's website. Um, and one of the things that she did when she first got her own TV show that was unheard of at the time in the 80s, the mid-80s, was she had an episode. And her episode was focused on child abuse. And the first thing she did during that episode is she came clean to the American public and she said, I'm a victim of child abuse. I was abused as a child. Now, talk show hosts at that time, uh, Phil Donahue was out there, they were not people who would share anything about themselves. They were distanced. The talk show host was over here, the program was over here, there was a separation, there was a gap. And what Oprah said is, you know what? If I want people to trust me, if I want people to believe in me, if I want to be genuine, I've got to share my story. And if I do that, people will follow me. And people will relate to me. And I'll be the kind of person that I want to be. And if you talk to anyone who's a big fan of Oprah, one of the things that they point to over the next 25 years that she would do over and over again is share her own belief, expose herself. And because of that, you felt this connection to someone who was clearly a superstar and a celebrity, but you felt a personal connection to her because she was able to do that. She was human. Then you've got Linda Resnick, 
who's a billionaire's wife. And she had an interesting idea. She's one of the main people behind launching Palm Wonderful Juice. And, and Peter Goober, um, who's a Hollywood producer, tells the, the story of her um, in his uh, great book, Tell to Win, which is all about the power of storytelling, which I highly recommend uh, you checking out. And what she, does, what she decided was that she wanted to go and buy uh, the original, follow me on this, the original fake pearl necklace that Jackie O used to wear in every photo. So Jackie O used to wear this pearl necklace. You can see it here as she was, you know, Jackie O obviously was the, was the um, wife of um, the uh, late president JFK, right? And she would wear these pearl necklace, this pearl necklace in every photo. Uh, and so it became iconic, it became a part of her. And it went for sale at a Sotheby's auction and the asking price was $25,000 for fake pearls, right? Not real pearls. Um, so Linda Resnick decided, I, I need to buy these. And so she goes off and she uh, sends someone to put in the bid and she gives them the, the ability to raise their bid. And ultimately she gets the necklace and she pays $227,000 for the necklace. So now you might be thinking, well, She's a billionaire's wife, who cares, right? I mean, $227,000, that's nothing for her. But she's not just interested in this necklace as a cool thing. She goes then to the Home Shopping Network, and she says we need to make a replica of this necklace, sell it for $150 without pretending like it's a real pearl necklace. It's al always been a fake, it's still a fake. But it's a replica of Jackie O's necklace, and she sells more than $20 million worth of these necklaces. Now, why would someone buy this necklace? It's not because you're pretending it's real, right? You're not faking people out. The reason why people bought this necklace is because they were buying into Jackie O's story. And by giving people that story, you gave them something they could retell to someone else. And that was a really powerful thing. That was the reason why people would pay $150 for fake pearls. Because the story is what mattered, not the pearls. So now you look at a hotel, a great hotel in Amsterdam called the Hans Brinker Budget Hotel. And what this hotel decided is that they are going to celebrate the fact that they're a completely crap hotel. Um, so they're a hostel. Um, they have generally really dirty sheets and everything is, is crap. But they said, you know what, we're going to be the world's worst hotel. And we're going to promote ourselves as the world's worst hotel. So here they've got um, things saying they can't get any worse. There's a great uh, image in the corner there that says free wireless with the neighbor's password. Uh, you know, they're celebrating the fact that they suck. It's honest, but why would you do that? Why would anyone stay at a completely sucky hotel? Well, now if you think about who goes to Amsterdam, it's all college kids who are on road trips and backpacking trips throughout Europe. So what does that kid care about more than comfort? They care about the story that they're going to post on Facebook or share with their friends or come back and tell to everyone who didn't go on the trip. And what better story could you have to say you stayed at the worst roach-infested crap hostel in Amsterdam and you survived? What a great story. And it worked. Domino's has gotten a lot of credit for also kind of taking this idea of being transparent and saying, you know what, our pizza sucked, tasted like cardboard, you told us it tasted like cardboard, but instead of stuffing our crust with something else to try and pretend like we didn't hear you, we're going to actually fix the pizza. How revolutionary. And really what it comes down to, and the main theme that I think here, is that unexpected honesty can be a solution for this believability crisis. Because unexpected honesty takes your marketing from blowing bubbles that pop to being something that's lasting, that's an event, that's important. And that, I think, is what we need to try and do. Because if we can do that, then we create this human connection, right? Here's a grocery store that says, you know what? It's not the best, but it's still okay, right? We still sell it, it's all right. Here's a great page from Mashable. If you type in the wrong link, this is the broken 404 error page, right? So here's another opportunity, right? You typed in something wrong. I could show you the 404 error page, but instead you got Keanu Reeves sitting here um, looking like a space cadet on top of a satellite. Random, but funny. I'll share it. And here I am taking a screen grab and sharing it with you. Squarespace, another example, right? You go online, you're trying to create a Squarespace account. You look for discount codes. How many of us do that, right? You're about to buy something, and then you just do a quick Google search to see if there's a discount code. So their first thing that comes up is a paid Google ad that says, sneaky you. You're looking for a discount code. Instead of making you search the internet, here's our discount code. 
If you look for it, here it is. How revolutionary. And my personal favorite, sometimes that honesty uh, goes both ways. And here's a great billboard from a company that said, you know what, we saw what Domino's is doing and it's interesting. So I'll leave you with that idea that unexpected honesty in every situation might be the solution for the believability crisis. There's a couple of ways to connect with me. Um, and I tried an experiment, which is a timed tweet while I was talking. Um, so if it came up through, your, uh, through the stream of conversation, then it'll point you to a blog post that has uh, some of the information on the things that I talked about uh, right now. So we'll see if that experiment worked. And thank you very much. I like that. That was really good.